Hello everyone, my name is Michael Steinhardt. I'm the technology editor here at CBS Interactive, and we're proud to present Keys to Crafting a High-Performing AppSec Strategy. This is a live and interactive webcast sponsored by ThreadX. Now, today we're going to explore the challenges of modern application security and learn how you can automate threat detection, lock down access, and most importantly, do it quickly. Now to do that, I'm very happy to introduce Jeremiah Cruitt, who is the Chief Information Security Officer at ThreadX. So let me tell you a little bit about Jeremiah. He has more than 25 years of leadership experience in the financial, telecommunications, and manufacturing sec sectors. Before joining ThreadX, he implemented a security program that resulted in no compromise system for over three years, and he's been recognized for creating innovative fraud protection and incident response programs. His specialties include security engineering and architecture, application security, anti-fraud, vulnerability management, incident response, forensics, and penetration testing. So I think you'll agree that we're in great hands today. And before I turn the mic over to Jeremiah, I just want to close with some housekeeping information. This is an interactive presentation, so you can use the Ask a Question button on the left side of your console at any point to send in questions. And we will set aside about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation to answer those questions. And if we don't get a chance to answer your question live, we can definitely respond via email. If you happen to be watching this on demand, we'll still respond via email. So don't hesitate to hit that Ask a Question button and get your questions in. And if you'd like more information about ThreadX, you can refer to the Related Resources widget on the right side of your viewing console. And with that, I'll turn things over to Jeremiah. Hey, thank you very much. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, I have 25 years of experience, and even before that, I was a, a kid running around in the dial-up era uh, doing uh, BBSs and war dialing. If you don't know what any of that means, uh, go watch a movie called War Games. Um, that was basically my childhood, <laughs> except no computer ever asked me if I wanted to play a game. Uh, this is a topic that's really near to my heart. Um, you know, uh, security has not been keeping pace with the rapid pace of development. Uh, moving to CI/CD and DevOps, where um, you know security is either being forgotten or it's slowing the process down, and uh, we don't want either one of those to happen. Uh, so we're going to discuss how security can move as fast as development, and uh, you know what are some good strategies to keep up. Uh, our first slide here, we're basically talking about uh, uh, challenges um, and the, the challenges we're going to see. So we're going to talk first about um, overall challenges. Uh, we're going to talk um, what are we seeing our problems, and then we'll go over and cover the three key topics. Um, uh, the issue right now what we're seeing is that uh, there are so many new different uh, application architectures, new ways that we're distributing content, uh, interacting with customers. Um, uh, there's just so many different things happening. We're not covering all of them. We see again and again many companies are not uh, covering every new API. We're seeing API breaches daily in the news. Um, we're seeing all sorts of overall issues. Um, and really, we're not seeing security tools, and especially legacy tools, keeping up with this. Um, a lot of the reasons for that, those legacy tools uh, require a lot of manual tuning. Um, there's a lot of uh, alert fatigue and other issues we're seeing with them. And you know, we're really seeing companies only focus on you know, the top 10% of the apps, if that. Um, you know, they're not covering all of the rest of the different applications. And, you know, as a former pen tester, we were always attacking that random app that everyone forgot about. And so, really, we need to be covering every single application, every single API, every single methodology of access, because those are those ones that are forgotten are often the ones that are attacked first. Um, and really, we need to move as fast as CICD and DevOps. Um, you know, with those changes in development, uh, things are happening daily, instantly. Um, you know, we're seeing thousands of updates a day uh, to applications. And if you can't automate that and keep up with that, uh, you're going to fail. And if you try to put uh, force security in front of it, you're going to impact business process and you're going to cause issues. You know, we see these challenges again and again. Um, the old detection models, you know, they, they're not working. Um, the tuning and effort that uh, it requires. And we see this across the entire security industry. You think about antivirus in the early days where, you know, everything was signatures and, um, you know, they basically moved to new models to be able to automate and detect uh, based on behavior and other methodologies. Um, we're also seeing not being able to keep up with new architecture. Um, you know, as we are deploying out Kubernetes and 
We're pushing out uh, systems uh, uh, in every possible method. Um, we still see um, a lot of security tools focused just on old, uh, old uh, single web applications and monolithic architectures. Um, so uh, really that process that we need to keep up with is, is moving so fast that uh, security is being left behind. Um, we're ca playing catch up. Um, you know, and the other issue here we talk about is scale. Um, if you can't automatically scale and move as fast as DevOps, uh, you're not going to be able to protect everything or you're going to start uh, hampering uh, how fast the business can move. So we're going to talk today mostly about these three different areas. Um, the first one is reliable automated detection. So um, we're looking for automated. Automate is absolutely the key. If you can't automate it, um, it's going to fail. This is sort of the DevOps model of everything has to be automated, um, has to be basically um, infrastructure as code. And if you can't do that in your security model, you're going to fail. Um, the other issue is you need to be able to automate your detection and automatically keep up with applications as they change and sometimes hundreds of times a day. Um, if you're not keeping up with that, you're not going to continue and you're not going to function. We also need to see consistent security, right? So we need to see security everywhere. Every new thing gets deployed. Um, every type of service needs to be protected, um, and it needs to be protected automatically. Um, so however you're, you're deploying, uh, security needs to be built into that and uh, integrated. Uh, and lastly, uh, we need to move at that same speed of DevOps, right? So security can't be slow. You can't be doing manual actions to solve issues. You can't uh, have to do a manual action to deploy a new security system or box um, out there. If you can't move as fast, uh, again, you're going to have problems. Um, so you need to have that. You also need to maintain independence of security. So. Uh, we'll talk more about that later, but really need to have security being there, independently evaluating and making sure that things are secure. So we'll go on the first point, uh, reliable automated detection and prevention. Uh, this is kind of going back to what I was mentioning about signatures. This, um, really, uh, signatures have been a problem in antivirus. They've been a problem in WAF. They've been a problem in a lot of different areas in security because the more accurate you are with a signature, um, the easier it is for attackers to evade. You know, you're looking for something very specific, they change a few things, and they're able to get through there. So you see a lot of false positives in that very precise model. Uh, conversely, the more generic you get to try and catch more things, uh, you start mistaking uh, um, attacks, uh, you know, customers for attacking, right? Um, you create many more false positives, and while you see more things, you also cause more interruption. And so. This balancing act has been the big issue we've seen in a lot of different security technology. Um, and it's really that problem that is really makes it uh, unable to keep up with security and, and keep up with attackers, right? So um, that signature issue um, comes up again and again, and we see it across many different platforms. Um, sometimes signatures are good, but uh, overall, um, if you're just relying on signatures, you're going to be um, causing significant issues just keeping up and managing it. We're seeing more and more companies and more security technologies moving to this specific model where you're looking for a more behavior-based model, right? You're looking for how is that attacker behaving, right? And this can't necessarily be a single uh, uh, hit, which is why um, signatures are often a problem. They're looking for one specific thing. This is looking at over time. Uh, this is looking for, um, you know, how attackers are coming in. Um, you look at the, initially, you're looking for those deviations from normal app behavior. So what do people normally behave like? What do, um, the, you know, as you, you're changing your applications, what are the new types of things that people are doing? You have to keep up with that and automate that so that, you know, as your application changes, that new normal um, becomes a normal standard. Um, on the attacker behavior, we need to start looking at um, it's more of that machine learning uh, methodology where you're saying, we're going to look for things that look like attacker behavior, right? So these sorts of things are attacker-like. Um, and so you start adding these things together, and then you start challenging attackers when they're attacking you. So you can actually start doing some active, um, uh, active challenges against them, uh, making things look different and seeing if they follow uh, it. Um, in, um, in WAFs, a lot of times what we're doing is, you know, putting a new URI in there and seeing if they follow it or different fields. Uh, and this is uh, something that we're seeing across the, the security landscape. 
um, uh, many companies are moving to this specific model. And this is something, risk engines are probably my favorite thing. It's something that has been done in the fraud space for a really long time uh, because, again, binary decisions of good and bad um, are difficult to make. It's a signature model where um, if you look like this, you're bad, right? And that doesn't um, really keep up with how attacks are changing. Um, it causes false positives and false negatives because either you're looking for one thing um, very specific or you're looking for more general. Um, risk engines allow you to take multiple different factors into analysis. So you can say uh, this is uh, this attacker is coming in uh, from somebody in a, a threat intel list. So this IP is marked as bad, right? But those IPs change all the time. So it's better just to say, well, if they're coming in from an IP um, that's, that's been malicious in the past, we're going to just give them some risk, right? The same thing with VPNs or Tor exit nodes. You know, if they're coming from a VPN, I'm coming from a VPN almost all the time. And I can't go to some sites because they just block me. They say, oh, he's coming from a VPN. That's bad. That's that binary decision that doesn't make sense. You know, we've been telling people to use VPNs forever, and then we start blocking them from going to sites. If you don't like people coming from VPNs, you just assign them some risk. You say they're slightly risky, a little bit more risky than somebody else not coming from a VPN. We're just going to watch them a little closer and see what happens, right? Um, that's the benefit of a risk engine. That's just one particular risk. Um, that also helps prevent false positives because you're looking at a composite score. So you're saying they're coming from a risky IP, um, they're um, very intense, so they're coming in faster than a normal human does. They look different than my normal traffic, plus they have some attacker-like behavioral signatures, right? So you add those things up together, and you get a, a risk engine that says, okay, I'm going to block that, right? So you make a good decision based on multiple factors. Each of those individual ones you don't want to specifically trust. You want to trust them together. Um, and I know I bash signatures a lot, but signatures can come back into play here because they can make a risk decision too. So you can say, if you match this signature, then give them this much risk, right? And so then you're not in that binary um, model of signatures. It's just part of your risk engine. Um, and so that's a great place to actually integrate them back in. Because still, signatures can be useful for very well-known attacks or things that are very specific or business logic issues. Um, that you want to deploy or, or, or put in there. And so you can add those into that risk engine and, and block based on them. So the risk and decision engine is probably my favorite thing that I think more security tools need to move down that model. Um, one of the great example of this is, is just looking at that automation, right? So we're looking at bots attacking all the time. Each individual bot uh, attack may not look that bad. It may not trip a, a signature. but when you start looking at the behavioral profile and you see, you know, them acting in more intense ways, you see them uh, hitting a site in an automated fashion, um, and you see them doing things that are maybe different than normal people. They keep hitting the same page over and over again, and most of the users uh, go to different portions of the site and do, uh, you know, standard uh, steps through your site. So um, you can kind of start to build that profile of that bot by using that risk engine and looking at a lot of different factors, right? So you're also looking at that behavior, exactly what they're doing. So we see a lot of bots that are doing credential stuffing. You can take a look at them and you say, okay, well, this looks like a normal person logging in once, uh, but now we can do some more behavioral profiling and say, okay, well, but they have a, a weird user agent and they're coming from an odd location and they're not behaving normally. And you can start looking at that more as a, a overall thing and actually start blocking them. Um, and then also great with bots is that we've talked about that active engagement, really giving them fake fields, um, giving them fake URIs and seeing if they follow them. Uh, that works for both bots and automated tools as well. So. Um, if somebody's scanning a site and it sees a URI hidden, um, it will oftentimes go and see what's at that. Um, that's how I operate when I do web app pen testing is I'm looking for, okay, what are the URIs that are mentioned but never actually gone to? Um, and I will go to those URIs because oftentimes there's something exciting there. Uh, but uh, um, if you're doing active reception like this and active engagement, you're actually uh, going to you know, assign risk to that. Like they went to this URI you're probably going to assign a lot of risk and block them at that point. So we're going to go on to the second one, talking about consistent security. Um, I think this one is uh, equally important, uh, um, you know, just because, uh, you know, there's so many different ways to get to your applications these days, and every single one of them needs to be protected. Uh, this is 
you know, I see this again and again is that we just don't have the protection we need for every different way into our environment. Um, in, even within our environment, I'm a, a big fan of securing not just externally but also internally. So uh, as you create all these different APIs internally, make sure that they're secured as well. We've seen a lot of different uh, uh, issues come up from uh, internal APIs as well. They're just completely open with no authentication and um, just uh, relying on you know, coming from a specific network. Um, all of these things may be protected. I do believe in the, so the zero trust model where you never trust a network and so you're always authenticating and validating everyone uh, to whatever they're going to. Um, so we're seeing a lot of different technologies out there really struggling with all the different methodologies, whether it's microservices and living in a Kubernetes environment, um, mobile or uh, obviously HIs is our big one that we're, we're seeing again and again. Um, and this is a great example of this. Um, let's say, uh, 2022, and I think 2022 is too far out. So that's probably the only thing I disagree with this uh, quote. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of API attacks. Um, uh, just last year, even, we had um, uh, a number of different breaches happen. Um, and the um, uh, the thing I'm saying is that I think 2018 was the start of this. 2019 is going to be a big year for API attacks. Um, and then I think that uh, really 2020, you know, API attacks will be the major focus. Um, you know, it's it's something that I think uh, is happening now and I think is increasing uh, significantly. So 2022 might be too far out there, but um, it's definitely something that the attackers have gone on to and uh, we're going to see. So, um, you know, companies like Panera and Delta um, have had major breaches like this, and we've seen many more, and we're going to continue to see them. Um, Part of the reason this is that APIs make it easy uh, for people to get data out of systems or uh, affect change. It's a great way to interact with customers and give them a way to automate. I love automation. I want to automate all the things. Um, but uh, attackers can use this too. So um, if you're giving an attacker an automated way to get data out, instead of getting 10 records out, they can get 20 million records. Um, you know, it makes it easy if you're not controlling it. So you need to have the exact same level of protection you have with every other service you provide. Um, you need to be authenticating it properly. You need to make sure that um, you're watching for behavior, watching for how people are accessing it, um, and making sure that you're doing proper authentication and access control. Um, it's really, uh, this is a new way that many companies have opened up access to their systems. Uh, you know, that, that access is great, but uh, it's just new vectors, right? It's new methodized to get in. So we're always looking for entry points on the attack side, and API is one of the first ones. If we see that, that's where we're going to go after. Um, and, you know, those APIs and the internal communication, people often forget about them or just, uh, you know, just allow it to happen. Uh, but you really need to be looking at that as well. There's a lot of different attacks um, against APIs that allow you to go to different ones internally. So you really need to be protecting every different API, API you have, whether it's an internal system or external system or whether it's in a Kubernetes cluster. You need to be watching for uh, misbehavior on those because the, the potential for harm is extremely high. So really protecting everywhere and everything they're doing is incredibly important. Um, and this is what we're saying is where um, you really need to have security be part of your strategy. It needs to be uh, deployed alongside everything else, right? So as you're deploying a new pod, you should have your security stack built into that. And so if you build a thousand pods, um, it's security is built in, it's automated, it's running, um, and it shares coverage internal to that system as well as from external. Um, so in protecting traffic within that system. So you need to have the security standard built in, designed, um, and flowing with everything you're doing. Um, really, if you, um, if you're not doing that, you're, you're going to be missing a lot of those internal attacks, and you're also not going to be having security deployed every time you have something new. I think one of the biggest issues we're seeing is people are just deploying constantly, and um, you know, security is playing catch up to say, okay, well, you just deployed a new pod, you deployed, deployed a new uh, service out there. Uh, is there any security on it? What are we doing? Um, and uh, automating it, having it as part of your standard build. I'm um, even sending control of saying you can't deploy this without having one of these in place. Um, that sort of methodology really is where you need to be getting to, um, really enforcing security to be deployed right alongside. Um, then this next point I think is the speed and really getting uh, into uh, DevOps and how we're we're deployed. Um, I think I love DevOps. It's great. It's fantastic. 
Um, you know, I think that the CICD and DevOps uh, methodologies um, are really helping us move to a new next generation of rapid deployment, rapid um, improvements in systems. Um, as we're pushing this out, it gives us tremendous power to to fix things right away, to add new capabilities immediately. Um, those continuous small improvements, that's that's the methodology that's designed, but if you're not keeping up with that, um, you, you're not going to have security um, within it. Um, you know, I think that, you know, within uh, within here, you don't want to reinvent anything, right? So, um, you know, we've got a lot of different APIs and methodologies for protecting them. Um, we already have the tools and technology available to protect APIs. Having those things embedded uh, with your DevOps model helps you uh, move quicker. Um, and these microservices architectures um, are fantastic, but again, security is not being deployed in there with them. You really need to have um, security built into those microservices, and really security should be a microservice itself, right? So if you have a, a security solution, it should be able to operate as a microservice alongside all of your other ones. Um, and really um, being able to support everything out there, so the web, mobile, API, um, DevOps is enabling uh, faster deployment of all of this. We need to be right there alongside it. And um, the whole application uh, DevOps model is really moving very fast and really providing so much value, um, but we just need to secure it. We need to keep alongside of it. And so as we talk more into that, um, really we need to move as quickly as that. We need to make sure that we're continuously learning. So, um, you know, as those changes go in, as you're making those micro changes to your code, um, you know, maybe you're adding new fields, maybe you're adding new pages, you're adding new capabilities, new functions. Um, all of those, if you're doing an old school model, um, you're really going to be having to update your security model at the same time. So every time you have a change, you're going to need to go in and update your security model and say, okay, this new field, it's not bad. It's a new new thing we've just implemented. If you're doing that, you really can't um, – you really can't function, right? It's it's uh, um, going to slow you down completely. So your system has to be able to continuously learn and behave, learn the new behavior, and just add maybe slightly amounts of risk into it, and then just modify and move on. Um, you know that whole continuous delivery. You know you can implement security into each different portion of it. So as you're developing your building, you should be testing um, your code, making sure it's secure. That should be an automated process that's happening. So you shouldn't have to be, you know, checking something in and waiting for a while and then saying, okay, it's good to go. Um, as you're testing, you should be testing with your entire security stack embedded. So you know if you're going to cause false positives. You know um, if it's going to be an issue with your security stack. You need to make sure you're testing completely with it. Um, and as you move forward uh, to deploy it, it needs to be automatically tested and validated. Um, and the cool thing about de uh, deploying uh, with security built in and automated is you can automatically roll back. So if you're deployed and suddenly you see a major security issue, you can roll back um, and move back. So CI, CD, and, and that continuous uh, process, it means you can go forward fast, but you can also go backwards fast, right? So, um, you know, if it's the same exact issue if you have code quality issues or you implement a bug in the platform. Um, any of those things you need to be able to roll back from. Security issues are just one more thing that you need to roll back from. Um, so if you deploy it, you see an issue, it needs to be automatically rolled back. Um, you know, and building security into the containers, um, building it uh, everywhere it goes, um, you know, I think is in incredibly vital. Um, you know, if it's not built in, if it's not part of your methodology, um, you're missing out, right? You're, you're going to cause issues. And you need to see in step. Um, with DevOps and how um, uh, they're deploying, right? So if you can't deploy alongside, uh, you're going to not be able to secure that application. Um, and I'm reusing this particular diagram again because I like it so much. But, um, you know, deploying security is part of the pod. As I've mentioned this. Um, I don't believe it should be integrated into the application itself uh, just because you need to keep that, that independent layer of security. Um, you deploy it as a microservice alongside. The great thing about this is it doesn't impact your development team. Um, your development team uh, has got many other different things to do rather than having to worry about uh, integration with a security product or security uh, tool to, to look for issues or concerns, right? They need to be developing the application. 
So deploying it separately allows you to maintain that, that full independent layer. Um, and it also means that you're not affecting your development, you're not affecting your code, you're not slowing them down at all, right? So you deploy it as a microservice along with everything else, um, and it stays independent. It's able to analyze completely separately. And yet you've deployed it, you've tested it, you've validated it. It's gone out with the entire platform, um, and it's just part of um, – your, your development cycle, right? So uh, I, I don't really believe in the term DevSecOps. I believe in really integrating um, security into the, the methodology of DevOps, right? So it just becomes another thing that you deploy. It becomes another uh, microservice that's pushed out along with everything else. So it's fully automated. It's fully deployed. Um, it's easy. Uh, it doesn't take burden on everyone, and it's automated, right? So everything has to be automated. If you can't automate it, you really are going to fail. Um, so the, the days of shipping out uh, physical boxes that have to go in place and get racked in a system, those are gone. Um, and we all need to move past that. We need to move to the point where we're you know, either dockerized containers or uh, able to uh, run as a microservice in any type of environment. Um, you know, that is, that's the modern age. It's modern development. That's how we're moving forward. Um, it's truly, I think, the, the way uh, and place we need to get to in security is to be fully automated, uh, dockerized containers, uh, microservice, um, integrated into an entire process and stack of development um, and pushed out. So a few takeaways here. Um, so those AppSec teams are uh, you know, facing new challenges, obviously. Um, I would say that, you know, we've always said that development needs to become more security focused. Well, Really what we're saying now is security needs to become more development focused. We need to understand how development works. We need to understand how it's getting pushed out. Um, how do we integrate without causing uh, serious issues and problems? Um, you know, we've always been the bad guy saying you need to do this specific thing or we were not going to allow you to deploy that. Um, what we really need to be saying is how do we integrate with your development process to make sure that we're testing for these specific issues, right? Um, you know, how do we test your code? Uh, as you're writing it, um, you know, without impacting you, or or how do you do your code quality uh, scans today? How are you looking for you know, issues that you can you might be pushing out there in the application? If you can integrate in the same way, same basic methodology, um, you know, security scanning of code is basically just another code quality issue, right? So get integrated in that process. Make sure that you can truly uh, deploy in that fashion, um, you know, and. As I've said, uh, you know, those legacy solutions, um, they're really obsolete. They, they will not function. Um, attackers are moving too fast. Our architectures and development are moving too fast. Uh, we can't be mired in that past of legacy solutions and legacy products that, you know, really um, are just not moving fast enough. Again, you can't ship boxes and, and rack them. Um, you know, if you can't deploy into any cloud environment that you might possibly need at any point, you're not going to be functional. If you're only one um, one cloud platform that you're integrated with, uh, that's not acceptable. It's not functional, right? Uh, in this multi-cloud environment where you can push out to anywhere, you need to be able to go into any environment at any point. Um, and this uh, point in red, I'm going to read it specifically, reliable automated detection, consistent security for all paths to the app and operate independently at the DevOps space. That is so key. I mean, that's that's really, the, in a nutshell, what we're talking about. Um, if you can't automate it, you shouldn't do it. That's the DevOps velocity, uh, philosophy. So um, really, yeah, automation is absolutely key. Reliable, everything needs to be reliable, but it, it's important to say that if you can't deploy fully redundant with pods, uh, you know, as part of the process, um, you're just not going to get there. Um, and, and we're going to, you know, lose, uh, lose the race to, to keep security built into all these uh, systems um, and consistent security really across all your systems across all your platforms don't forget anything make sure you're protecting and monitoring everything uh, those back doors are where hackers go to uh, it's where pen testers go to it's what we want to go and find it's always that box in the corner or that random website that no one has protected for you know 20 years or looked at um, those are the ones that we go after um, you know, the test ones that somebody deployed for just, you know, I'm going to throw this out there and see what happens. A lot of times those will still have really useful information for us to go after other systems with. So you need to protect 
every different avenue and you need to protect it consistently. If you have 50 different tools to protect different uh, platforms and different architectures, you're going to fail. Um, and you're going to have too many people that have to manage all of that. Um, and obviously operating as quickly and as fast as DevOps is moving is, is vital. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of different solutions address this. So, you know, you start looking at, you know, what AB has done. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, you know, a lot of the different uh, uh, modern uh, um, uh, SaaS tools are, are helping us um, look at code as it's being developed, as people are typing it in, looking for issues and popping it up and saying that that's the incorrect way to, to form this or um, giving uh, tool tips right in, in your, uh, your coding tool. So there's a lot of different methodologies and a lot of different companies are doing that. Uh, we see WAFs doing this now that, you know, um, obviously we're a WAF company. We're doing this, you know, we're looking for uh, behavior based and analysis. We're looking at how do we move as quick as DevOps? How do we make sure that we're completely uh, able to deploy in a containerized environment uh, as a microservice? So, um, and protecting all the things, right? If you can't protect every different system, every API, every microservice, um, every web server, every web app you've got out there, um, and you can't protect the mobile side, um, you know, you're letting the hackers in. You're, you're going to be breached. There's going to be issues, and it's going to be from uh, whatever you haven't protected, because that's what we're always looking for is uh, the systems that you haven't protected um, and the uh, other areas we see in there. All right, well, at the end of the slide deck, um, I think we're going to open up for questions, see if there's anything we can answer. Um, and uh, I will hand it over to the moderator for that. Thank you so much, Jeremiah. Uh, once again, this is Michael Steinhardt, and I would like to remind everybody in the audience that there's still time to get your questions in if you haven't already. And you can also learn more about ThreadX and even download a copy of today's presentation in the related resources links to the right of your console. Uh, but Jeremiah, let's jump in with uh, one of the questions that came in that I think dovetails pretty neatly with what you've been talking about in terms of uh, keeping, you know, the pen testers that are looking for stuff that, that people threw up sort of as an afterthought maybe even a year or two ago, uh, and it's just sitting on the system and sitting on the network and, and basically ripe for exploitation. Um, so the question is, what is... What is it specifically about the traditional security solutions that, that makes them obsolete when you know held up against today's modern app environments and architectures? Because it sounds as though some of the some of the exploits and some of the vulnerabilities that you're describing are older ones that might be left over from legacy um, systems. And so, you know, is the traditional security approaches that that were in place back in the day sufficient, or you know, what makes them less effective? in today's environments and also in today's threat landscapes? You bet. So I, I think that covers a lot of different areas. Uh, one of the things I will say is that, you know, signature-based uh, technologies, whether it's antivirus, whether it's web application firewalls, um, or just about any security product we've seen, um, we're never able to keep up, right? Um, you know, it, it's the same thing where uh, in the antivirus world, uh, we'd have a signature that matches a specific executable, I repack that executable, and now um, it isn't seen by any antivirus. And most of the antivirus companies have kind of caught up with this. You know, uh, some of them started out saying, this is just not functional. I'm going to look at this from a behavioral standpoint. I'm going to see, you know, do some machine learning and say, okay, I'm going to read in every single executable that's malicious and every single executable that's non-malicious and do a comparison of those two and say, okay, this is what malicious looks like, this is what non-malicious looks like, and make that behavioral sort of machine learning based uh, analysis of, of that. And so um, we've seen that really solve uh, issues in um, antivirus. And now WAF companies are coming to the same conclusion to say, you know, we need to look at more what's behavior like, right? Uh, what attacker behavior like is um, rather than looking for specific signatures. Because every time you have a signature, it's really easy to bypass it. So those are really the legacy solutions. Um, the other point to that is, yeah, a lot of people didn't deploy those solutions be, uh, to every single system because they were either horribly inefficient um, or they were unable to truly protect it. And part of the problem is, too, that they would deploy it in front of a, a system. It would take them months to configure and get ready, especially in the web applications. 
Um, and then they'd start having false positives and they'd start t- tuning it down. So they might get to one or two websites and have it sort of partially protecting them, but never get to every single website and every single API and every microservice. Uh, that seems unthinkable in the traditional model, right, um, of having to build and tune and analyze for every single one you deploy. Um, so, if you again, if you're not automating it, if you're not able to automatically analyze that web application in near real time, um, you're really not going to be able to protect all those different systems, and you're going to stop at one or two, which is what we've seen again and again across so many different organizations. Gotcha. And that actually dovetails very neatly with, with another question that came in. It sounds like somebody in our audience is basically describing the kind of um, experience that you just listed out. Uh, He says, we haven't been able to get our web application firewall into blocking mode just because of all the false positives that are coming in and the tuning and updates uh, that are needed to stay up to date with development. So really, how can anybody implement one of these in a CI CD DevOps environment uh, which, as you said, you know, it's just it's just so labor intensive. So it sounds as though automated automation is the answer. But uh, I'd like you to just uh, elaborate a little bit on how yeah I can really get this thing off the ground. Well, and I see a lot of different things there. The answer automation is important, uh, but that more behavioral learning uh, and uh, risk engine based approach allows you to kind of be able to get in front of a website and learn it automatically, right? So. Um, once you get in front of there, you can kind of do that initial tuning, that initial analysis. You're looking at what normal traffic looks like automatically. You're looking at what, uh, you know, abnormal traffic looks like. And you're putting them into buckets and doing sort of a more statistical analysis, right? So you're automating that. Um, so you're learning the application, what's normal, what's abnormal. As it changes, you're keeping up with that. So you're always retuning that, that profile. And so people might get into the slightly abnormal bucket. Um, uh, for a little bit, but as the applica- as more people go and do that exact same function, it becomes more and more normal, and it just becomes a zero risk type of item. Um, again, adding that whole risk engine process in there, um, adding your uh, behavioral analysis of what attacker behavior looks like, um, so you don't have to tune for every single different site deploy. That's key. And and I will tell you that I have I've been a hater of web application firewalls my entire career because. I have been a CSO in a number of different companies and, and in charge of, of getting this technology out there and just been incredibly frustrated because the, the tuning process, the professional services, the, the effort it took just to get one site up and running was just, uh, just impossible. And um, from that experience, I, I just um, I was always looking for a better solution for that. And so um, I met ThreadX and, and talked to them a bit and they, they had the same exact concerns and issues I had. So, you know, gone from a WAF hater to now a WAF lover of, you know, but it's because of that that new type of methodology, that cloud-native approach that's really looking at uh, attacker-centric behavioral analysis um, rather than individual signatures. And, and I'm not going to say that there are no signatures because we write signatures for very specific things. Uh, we write signatures for business logic. Um, you know, customers will ask us to say we don't want – this particular URI to be able to access from this specific area of the world. Um, and we can just write that as a static signature, right? So uh, we're writing those. Those just go all into our risk engine. Um, but uh, that whole approach uh, made so much more sense and really um, keeps the false positives extremely low and, and allows people to deploy to everything, right? So um, if you had to do tuning on every single application, every single API, um, and you had to have a whole team of experts there who knew uh, web application security, uh, looking through uh, the alerts, looking through, you know, what should we block, what should we not, uh, That it, that's something that doesn't scale well and something that is just a, a losing battle. So, um, you know, that's why I think ThreadX took that approach they did and really made it a fully managed service to do a lot of that work for you, but also having this sort of machine learning and analysis that's going on in the background. Gotcha. Um, and once again, you teed up the next question that uh, that we have from our audience, and that is, how does the security required for APIs differ from those of traditional web apps? I mean, it sounds as though that, that you know, as the CISO and as the, you know, part of the security operations team, you, you need to worry about both. But what are the considerations for APIs that, that differ from traditional web apps? Well, I will say that there's a lot of things that don't differ to start with, right? So a lot of the same attacks I can do against web applications, I can do against 
uh, APIs. And, you know, I can embed SQL injection. I can uh, attack the authentication model. There's a lot of things that you can do with an API that's the exact same thing you can do with a web application. And then, you know, also that, that profiling and analysis, you know, looking at what's normal behavior on API is exactly the same as on a web application, right? So normally people do these types of requests and get this size of a response or this type of a response, you know, looking at what's normal and then looking at the abnormal for that. Um, and then obviously looking at the attacker uh, methodologies and, and building that sort of analysis of how do people attack uh, APIs um, and building that into the behavioral analysis uh, engine. So those things, that, there's a lot of things that are very similar. Um, some of the things that are very specific are, you know, uh, JSON formatting attacks and other areas where if you're not actually validating the, the JSON input I'm putting in, uh, it's an easy way to compromise systems. Um, I can embed uh, SQL injection. Um, I can em embed uh, LDAP, bond, uh, LDAP uh, attacks. I can embed a lot of different things into that JSON. If you're not validating it, um, just like you have to do on a web app, actually, uh, you, you know, you've got serious issues. So, um, you know, that JSON analysis and validation uh, has got to be a key part of your, a your API security, um, but also having something that's sitting there looking for those types of attacks and alerting when you, somebody's trying it. Um, and uh, and looking for the things that you didn't think about could be possible. So, um, you know, there's a lot of similarities, but there's a, a few differences. Um, I see a lot of uh, authentication issues with APIs, and it's probably one of the biggest thing where, um, you know, people don't do proper authentication and they don't do proper um, authorization. So, you know, not everyone should be able to do a delete. Um, you know, an unauthenticated user shouldn't be able to delete. They should only be able to do a, a get or um, you know, so there's a lot of different things where, uh, for those APIs, there's some very things very specific, but a lot of it's very similar. Cool. It right, looks like we have uh, one more question, and that is, uh, and again, it, it kind of looks like there's an easy answer and a more involved answer, but, but how integrated or independent should security be in relation to the DevOps process? Well, so there's two different things. There should be integration, um, and it, ne it doesn't necessarily have to be um, a a full um, uh, like you have to have a security person in the DevOps team. But you know, you need to make sure that as Dev DevOps is is building configurations, um, that you're validating those configurations are appropriate and secure, right? So uh, infrastructure as code means it's all being checked in, um, and you can validate exactly what's being built into a container. Um, and look at that container and say, okay, this is exactly what's in that, right? Anything different from that, you should destroy that container, right? And so um, that integration in the DevOps process really is validating those configs are appropriate. Um, you know, you're not uh, installing, you know, out-of-date software um, or, you know, if there's a, a security issue, issue with a, a version of software that you ask them to basically update that in the configuration, right? So that integration of, of patch management is really important. Um, but, uh, you know, as they're uh, pushing out things, I think, you know, if you can containerize uh, your security solutions and have them as microservices that just go along with everything else, uh, you make DevOps life a lot easier, too. So they, they don't have to think about, okay, now I have to build this in as well into this container and, and I have to, uh, you know, add these functions to, to integrate with this web service. Um, you just have it as another microservice that, you know, either has to proxy through or it, it uh, queries, but um, it, it should be just kind of built in there. So you can kind of keep yourself independent uh, in one fashion where um, that, that independence allows you to make sure that, that things are being done correctly, that, um, you know, you're not, you know, implementing uh, security vulnerabilities into your platform. Um, and that uh, there aren't, you know, major security issues in the web application you're putting out, whether it's an API or a web app. Um, so having some independence there to validate and um, scan and test and, and make sure things are done appropriately, I think is also very important. Great. Well, thank you so much for that. And uh, with that, I think that definitely brings us to the time limit that we have in place. So I want to thank Jeremiah Cruitt of ThreadX for taking the time to share this insight with us today. I would also like to thank ThreadX for sponsoring the webcast. Um, if you would like to refer back to this webcast on demand, if you want to 
review or you want to pass the link along to a colleague, uh, it will be available within 48 hours for on-demand viewing. And as I mentioned earlier, if you'd like to learn more about ThreadX, you can refer to the related resources widget just to the right of your viewing console, and you'll also find a downloadable copy of today's slides. So with that, I'll thank everybody for participating. My name is Michael Steinhardt for CBS Interactive, and have a great day.